This module focuses on the Satvahana period, costume and culture. The Satvahana period lasted from 200 BC to 250 AD. Satvahana or Andhra Empire endured for 460 years in unbroken continuity. It ran parallel to the Kushan Empire. Peaceful period of trade and industry increased tremendously, especially with Rome. Foreign influence brought sophistication to the way of life. Racially, Deccan people were a hybrid ethnic group. Aboriginal Dravidians, Scythians or Saka, Parthians or Pallavas and Greeks or Yavanas. Ajanta caves, Sanchi gateways and structural stupas of Amravati, Goli and Jagiapet were some of the architectural achievements of this period. These are the six symbols used to denote royal personage. Ushnisa, this was a turban. Chauris, a pair of fly whisks made of yak tails with gold handles. Umbrella, white and gold for kings and nobles, was carried by Chaturdharas. Khadga, which is a sword, was carried by Khadga Vahini. Sandals, thonged made of boar skin. Royal standard, the royal standard with its special emblem was carried before the king in processions. Simhasana, the royal throne was used in all state occasions. Costumes were a mix of indigenous and foreign garments. First century BC, tunics or kanchika in stripes or beehive patterns were worn. These are mid-thigh length with short or long sleeves with an opening at the right side or front. They were worn by attendants, stablemen and also worn during hunting. With this tunic, a thick kayaband was wound once or twice around the waist, along with the turban. Hunters wore two bar-type sandals with a strap for buckling. Women used short antharyas, large utharyas with elaborate broad borders covering their heads and back. Tikas on foreheads, series of conch or ivory bangles. It had a massive primitive character compared to later Satvahana period. Soldiers wore earrings of the wheel pattern. Indigenous jewellery consisted of the lambanam, a pair of kangan and bajuband for males. Women wore large number of bangles made of conch or ivory disc type earrings, the lambanam and tikas on the forehead. Women attendants at court wore an additional mekla. We will now look at the early Satvahana military apparel. Soldiers wore short sleeved tunics or jackets with elaborate headgear, consisting of either turban with top knot, chin band, and ear flaps, or two top knots with turban. They carried axes, bows, arrows, or sickles. Palace guards wore antarya with a heavy cloak draped over the left shoulder. To cope with climatic conditions, clothing was sparse and made of thin cottons. Uttarya, antarya, and kayaband still formed the base of all costume. Vethaka, a simple sash, patika, flat ribbon shaped pieces of cloth, kakshabandha, heavy looking one for men with a thick jeweled roll with hanging tassels, kalabuka, a girdle made of many strips plated together, muraja, this had drum headed knobs at the ends instead of tassels. The headgear and hairstyles during this period featured a variety of costumes and accessories. Short hair parted in the middle, reaching the neck was also prevalent. Also popular was small, crown-like fillets through which hair was drawn and plaited or left loose. Ushnisa The Ushnisa was wrapped around the head three or four times after covering the top knot of hair with one end, usually white but sometimes in dyed cloth. Patbandhas These were simple turbans and were held in place by ornamental gold strips. Kirita Crowns were worn with gems and ornamentation. Molibandh 
This was an elaborate turban wound with hair, then decorated with string of pearl or flower wreaths. Molimani, a jeweled clasp to hold turban in place. Praveni, praveni or plate at the back decorated with jeweled strips and tassels. A coil with five delicate plates hanging from it. Kesa Pesa, style. In this style, the hair was looped close to the head in an elongated knot at the back of the head. Veni, a small fillet of flowers around it or a short garland hanging from it. Kabari Bandha is a simple knot. Dhamelia, an elaborate dressing of hair with flowers, pearls and jewels that often completely covered the hair. Kudamini, this was lotus shaped, its petal composed of pearls and precious stones, worn in the center of knotted hair. Makarika, this was shaped like fish crocodile, was worn at the front parting of hair. Strands of pearl were the main motif in all forms of jewelry in the late Satvahana period. Kundala, a coil shaped earring. Talapatra, a small strip of palm leaf rolled and inserted into the lobe. Later, this shape was made from ivory or gold studded with gemstones. Kanaka Kamala, a full blown lotus design. Karnika, Karnika or Jimki, shape of a lotus seed pod fixed upside down like a tassel. Hara, Hara or necklaces were mainly strung pearls. Ekavali, a single string necklace. Yashti necklace, Yashti necklace with gem and gold beads. Falaka, slab like gems were added to the necklaces. Falakahara, when several strings are held together with the falaka. Yajnupavita or sacred thread, all of pearl called Mukta Yajnupavita was used commonly. Kanta, a shorter necklace. Niksha, a gold coin necklace strung on silk thread or plated gold cord. Mangamalai was similar to Niksha except instead of gold coins, the shape was that of mangoes. Falkavalaya, slab like gems were set into bracelets. Simple perfumed cotton thread necklace was used. Tiger claws were also strung around the neck of children. Valaya men and women wore bracelets of solid gold set with precious stones. Delicate bracelets were made of filigree, while bangles were made of ivory and rhinoceros horn. Keyura. These armlets were used for both sexes. They were often snake-shaped, straight and angular-edged. Talapatra a small strip of palm leaf rolled and inserted into the lobe. Later, this shape was made from ivory or gold studded with gemstones. Meklas was still worn only by women. Kansi is a girdle with tinkling bells. Rasana, a girdle style made of linked chains or strong pearls, beads or precious stones. Anklets were worn only by women. Manjira was a hollow, light and coiled loosely several times around the ankle. It tinkled when moved as it had a gem inserted into the hollow. Nupura was plain while Kinkinis had small bells suspended. Tulakoti, a heavier looking anklet with two enlarged ends. Anguliaka, a fingering. Hema Vaik Vikaksha, two long wreaths of flowers or pearls crossed at the breast. Military costumes. Antarya and Kayabandh were used. Chennavira was used to carry a sword at the belt with a buckle at the center. The military wore earrings and simple jewelry. Saka soldiers wore tunics with long ruched sleeves. With it, they wore the churidar or ruched trousers. Sirastra, a helmet with ear flaps. A short quilted tunic was worn with a heavy drape over the left shoulder and a white sash around the waist. Military equipment. The main equipment was the sword, shield, bow, axe, spear, mace, club, 
javelin, gadda club, dhanush bow, uh, some gramika, rata war chariots. Sword handles were highly decorated and shields were large and rectangular in shape. Religious apparel. Buddhism flourished under the patronage of Nagarjuna. Early period monks wore rags patched together and then dyed reddish yellow. In later periods, patchwork fabric was composed of rich materials. Valkala, deer skin uttarya, called Jata Bhara, hair was worn in small plates. Textiles and dyes. Textile manufacturing and trade flourished in this period. Borders with swans were worn on the brides. Colors were used in stories for cultural interaction. For example, a lady going to meet her lover by night wore blue or white according to the moon phases, while new mothers wore yellow. Architectural art featured crowded compositions of lean and strong bodies and ferocious figures looming over terrified crowds. We sense a frenzied activity and turbulence. Commerce increased and trade with Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Myanmar, China and Rome was brisk. This module focuses on the Kushan period costume and culture. In the first century AD, Kushans came into Punjab and established their empire. The political stability of the Maurya Empire was replaced by continuous changes in the struggle for supremacy. Cultural and linguistic differences were immense and trade was the only cohesive factor. There were two very distinct styles, Gandhara and Mathura. There was no uniformity in style and dress varied with each region. Fashion of wearing sewn garments made headway. Apart from other religions, the teachings of Christ and Zoroaster were also known which led to a cosmopolitan attitude. Gandhara, Buddhist patrons employed craftsmen from Eastern Rome who bought with them the Greco-Roman style. Mathura, it was a direct continuation of the native Indian school of Barhut and Sanchi. The style is distinct, stiff and formal. Clothes are heavy, severe and totally unsuited to the Indian climate. It was probably worn only on formal occasions. Peshawar, the capital boasted of many magnificent buildings, wealth and prosperity due to foreign trade. Kanishka, the ruler of the empire, was a patron of arts. Life lived by the court and people was rich and full of bustle and activity. Cultural activities like singing, dancing, music, drama and magic shows during festivals were encouraged. During the Kushan period, trade routes improved, roads were made permanent, trees were planted along highways, rent houses were pr provided, signposts installed and distances marked. These helped in reducing risks in trade and commerce. Toll tax was levied on merchants as maintenance of these roads was expensive. Ivory became an important export item. It was used to make the legs of beds and tables, handles and knobs of mirrors, fly whisks and scepters. It ornamented chairs and carriages, walls of houses, sword hilts and scabbards. Combs, brooches, hairpins, boxes, bindings for manuscripts were also made from ivory. People also used glassware from Syria, lacquerware from China and metalware with Greco-Roman origins. Mandalas was a new style of architecture, featured a lantern roof structure. Village dwellings consisted of a single room with a floor of beaten earth. The mud walls had one window and door. The roof was of reed, palm leaf or matting. If there was a need to divide the room, a few mats were hung from the beams that held up the roof. As most people sat on the floor, there was no need for furniture. A simple bed or charpai was used. Pots of earthenware or copperware used for storage and cooking. The Kushan Indo-Scythian dress evolved from a nomadic culture based on the use of horses.
It consists of ruched, long sleeve tunic with a slit for the neck. A short cloak, a calf length woolen coat or kaftan was worn loose or crossed over. This was secured by a leather or metal belt. Chugha was a coat like garment decorated with a border down the chest and hemline with two slits to facilitate movement. The trouser could be loose or close fitting. Chalana was tucked into soft padded boots with leather trappings or kapusa. The headdress was a Scythian pointed cap or felt or bashilk peaked helmet or headband with two long ends tied at the back. Clothes for women were varied. They generally wore a sari like garment, rouge sleeve tunic, stanam sukha, and ghagri. Women also wore close fitting rouge trousers with long sleeve jackets and utarya. A sari like garment, which evolved from the Roman palla with the Indian kacha style antarya, was used. The rouge sleeve tunic was also adopted and worn underneath this drapery. Stanam Sukha was a mid thigh length tunic worn with antarya in lehenga style. Ghagri was a simple stitched skirt with side seams and a nada or string to hold them up at the waist. In the Kushan period, headgear and hairstyles, uttarya as a head garment seems to have disappeared. Men continued to wear turban, now called mauli but not in the complicated knot of the Maurya Sunga period. When bareheaded, hair was worn in a top knot or in the shape of a bow, often softened by curls. Young men sometimes left their hair short. In relation to the Maurya and Sunga periods, we see a tendency towards greater refinement and simplicity. Gold, silver and copper were used often, encrusted with cornelia, agates, lapis lazuli, amethysts, garnets, corals and pearls. The art of enameling was known. Inlay work in shell and mother of pearl and filigree was also employed. Head covered uttaryas were replaced by bejeweled diadems, crowns or mukut or headband called opasa. The trend was by far simpler and lighter as compared to the previous period. The earliest foreign influences in costumes were found in the military. The coat of mail, made of metallic wires, probably iron, woven into gauze known as jhalka. Improvised versions of this are also seen. Trade was established directly through the silk route. Coarse cotton and wool were used for making tunics and trousers for horsemen, hunters, foreigners and doorkeepers. Tulapansi, a lightweight cotton, was used. Indigenous and foreign silks were plentiful and expensive. Antarias were rarely decorated. When they were, they appeared in either embroidered, woven, or were printed in diagonal check designs, enclosing small circles. Uttarya for rich women were often bejeweled with pearls. Kushana were foreign race that were occupying a very large part of India. Their influence was felt in what developed into Gandhura and Mathura style. As compared to carvings found earlier at Barhut and Sanchi, these had more sophisticated and flamboyant images. The carvings featured the provocative display of courtesans with their sinuous bodies in the Tribhanga pose and the delicate flower-like gestures of the hand. This module focuses on the Etrurian and Roman costume and culture. In 800 BC, in certain areas of the Italian peninsula, now called Tuscany, a culture had developed that was superior in skill and artistic production and more complex in cultural organization than its neighbors. They were called Etruscans. They were superior in arms and fighting ability and seized strategic points along the coast moving inward. They were in the minority, dominant, military and aristocratic. Records of their life are found in wall paintings, statues or objects left in their elaborate necropoli or grave sites. They improved the arable land and planted vineyards and olive groves, but also mined and smelted iron ore, 
exploited deposits of copper, traded throughout the Mediterranean area and amassed great wealth. Very little is known of Etruscan family life. Evidence suggests that women shared greater importance in society than in both Greek and Roman societies. Statues and paintings found show men and women reclining together in couches at banquets with expressions and attitudes of warm affection. They are depicted in relaxed, informal poses. Art and trade had a strong Greek influence as Greece and Etruria had an active and close trading relationship. The scenes of daily life depicted by Etruscans were not of Greeks but of Etruscans. This indicates not only dress styles and conventions peculiar to Etruscans but also the ways in which respectable women are depicted as dining and appearing with men in public. Rich Etruscans also purchased imported art objects from abroad, especially from Greece, and placed them in their tombs. Perizoma was a loincloth that was worn alone as an outer garment by laborers and physically active men. When worn as an undergarment, it was placed under a short, shirt-like chitin or slightly longer tunic. Doric peplos was made in woven plate or decorated with embroidery. Ionic chitin was also adopted and worn between 580 BC to 300 BC. Etruscan's chitin tended to be shorter and less voluminous than Greek chitons. Some appear to have sleeves cut and sewn into the garment, giving it a closer fit and less draped appearance. Upper class Etruscan women wore a badge of status of a fringe or tassel that hung down at the front and back of each shoulder. This picture depicts a woman on an Etruscan sarcophagus in a Doric chitin dress with a purple bordered shawl draped around her body, over her shoulders and drawn over her hair. Her jewellery includes a tiara, earrings, necklace, bracelets and finger rings. Etruscans developed wraps for warmth. Heavily woolen cloak were used by men, similar to Clamis Hymatian. Tibena. This was a rounded mantle worn by both men and women. It was woven with a curved edge in a roughly semicircular or elliptical form. It was draped in various ways. Like a clamis, was worn back to front with the curved edges hanging down in front and the two ends thrown back over the shoulder. Like a hymatian, it is considered a forerunner of the Roman toga. In the archaic period, men wore medium-length hair and pointed beards, while women arranged their hair in a single braid or in long flowing tresses. In the post-archaic period, men kept their hair short and faces clean-shaven, while women's hairstyles were like those of Greek women of that time. Headgear included wide-brimmed hats like the petesos for men and fillets to confine hair for both sexes. On joyful events, both sexes wore crown-like headpieces. Both wore high-crowned brimless hats. Men's styles were peaked, while women wore the tutelus with a rounded crown. Both men and women wore sandals, a style often in red covered the foot up to the ankle and had an elongated toe that curled upwards. And now about Roman culture and costumes. The main sources of information comes from Roman art, literature and archaeological excavations. Greek artists were brought to Rome to work often as slaves. Roman art showed strong Greek influences. Frescoes were developed in Rome. Paintings on plaster were used in decorating interiors of buildings. Mosaics with pictures created from small pieces of colored stone. Literary works such as plays and satires provide names of garments and insight into current attitudes toward particular styles as well as information on how they were brought, worn or used to create an impact on friends. During the early Roman history, Rome was ruled by Etruscan kings. A revolution in 509 BC ended the Etruscan reign. 
the Roman Republic had a conservative government with two councils elected annually, who exercised the powers and in time of war commanded the armies. It also had a senate and a popular assembly. Under this form of government, Rome fought a series of wars and expanded their control over all of Italy, North Africa, large areas of Middle East, Eastern Europe, up to the Danube River, and most of continental Europe. Rome became a wealthy and complex society. The strain of war on society and economy resulted in social strife, and the rivalries of ambitious generals led to civil war, and to the appointment of a dictator for life, Julius Caesar. For about 200 years, the Caesars gave the Mediterranean world peace and prosperity and added Arabia, Africa, part of Germany and Britain to their empire. The Roman Empire declined by about 3 AD because of the flawed quality and competence of the emperors, military anarchy, civil wars and failure of the economy. A major cause was also the migration of German tribes into the land in search of land and provisions. The Eastern Roman Empire, ruled by Constantine 325 AD, constructed Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, wealthy and secure, grew into the Byzantine Empire. During the early imperial period, Rome consisted of Roman citizens, their families, their slaves, and foreigners. Only men were citizens, but they could be rich, middle class, or poor. By 2 AD, if Roman residents were foreigners to whom citizenship was extended, well-to-do population lived in townhouses built around a sunny courtyard and decorated with colorful frescoes, or in large, comfortable apartments of buildings that rose to four to nine stories high. The less affluent and poor lived in tall apartment buildings, sometimes under crowded conditions, poor lighting, bad ventilation and constant threat of fires. Aristocracy lived in large households of relatives, servants, who were often freed slaves and household slaves. Heading every Roman family was the oldest male member, Pater Familias, who was the sole owner of family possessions. The married women supervised the children and the household. Dress for a Roman primarily signified rank, status, office or authority. Primary distinction was between citizens and non-citizens. Male citizens were entitled to wear the toga. Others were prohibited from wearing it. Senators were distinguished by their dress. Their tunics had broad purple bands that extended vertically from hem to hem, across the shoulders. These bands were called clavi or clavus. They, were also, uh, they also wore shoes with laces that wrapped around the leg, halfway to the knee. The tunic of knights had slightly narrower purple bands and they wore a gold ring that signified their rank. Wool and flax were the most important fibers used for clothing. In Roman Republic times, varied types of fabrics and ready-made garments were available in the market. Used clothes were cut into patches and made into cloaks or quilts for slaves. Linen or wool fabrics could be gauze-like or tightly woven. They may have had a soft pile also. Cotton was also used. It was mixed with linen for better drape and luster when pressed. Silk was also available but expensive. It was blended with linen. Fabrics were dyed to a wide range of colors. Women did produce fabric for their families. However, the textile industry was not a home craft. Large estates often produced their own cloth. Here the work was largely done by women in a workshop called gynecium many of whom were slaves. Much of the weaving, dyeing and finishing was carried out in business establishments which employed 50 to 100 men and women. These factories were located in many towns. Some cities were especially well known for making certain types of textiles or clothing items. Shoemakers were apparently sufficiently great that differentiation was made between bootmakers, sandal makers, etc. 
Romans made a distinction between garments that were put on, indutus, and garments that were wrapped around, amictus. Initially, both men and women wore the toga. By 2 AD, it was owned, worn only by male Roman citizens. The earlier usage was, was preserved in the practice of having freeborn boys and girl child wear togas till they reach puberty and become citizens, at which point the girl child would stop wearing the toga. The displayed table explains the different types of toga that were used in ancient Rome. Roman version of the tunics ended around the knees, were short-sleeved and T-shaped. They were worn as underclothing or night shirts for upper-class men. Belted tunics served as street costume for the common man. By the end of the first AD, tunics were cut short in front, then back, and shorter versions were used by the military and manual labourers. Several layers were worn in winters, one as an undergarment, interior tunic, and one as an outer garment, superior tunic. During 3 AD, tunics had lengthened and covered the lower leg, reaching to the shin. Only military men and labourers continued to wear the shorter version. Roman men used a variety of costumes. These included subligar, a Roman loincloth was worn as an undergarment by middle and upper class men. It was also used as a working garment for slaves. Cloaks and capes served as outdoor garments for cold weather and were made with or without hoods. Lacerna, a rectangular cloth with rounded corners and a hood. Lina, a circle of cloth folded to a semicircle that was thrown over the shoulders and pinned at the front. Byrus, this resembled a modern hooded poncho, cut full and with an opening through which the head was slipped. Paludamentum, a large white or purple cloak similar to the Greek clamis worn by emperors and generals. Synthesis A garment worn by men at dinner parties instead of toga. It was made of lightweight materials as opposed to the heavyweight toga. Women's costume consisted of undergarments, several layers of tunics and outer mantles, subligaria and strophium. Undergarments consisted of subligaria, loincloth and a band of fabric, the strophium, that supported the breasts. It looks like a modern-day two-piece bikini suit. The tunic was the basic garment for women and had the appearance of the Greek chiton. It reached the ankle or floor. Like men, women wore an under tunic and an outer tunic. The palla. A draped shawl, the palla was placed over the outer tunic, casually draped across the shoulders or pulled over the head like a veil. Cloaks. For outdoors, women covered themselves in cloaks like the pinula. Stola, a garment for free married women. It is a sleeveless outer tunic. Veil, although the palla was worn exclusively by Roman matrons, they were expected to cover their heads with pallas when they left their homes. Vita, a woolen band used to bind her hair. Tutelus. A Roman matron became the mater familias only when her husband became the pater familias. This status was designated by a special hairstyle, the tutelus. The effect was a conical shape similar to Etruscan women's headdress of the same time. Rincinium. Women wore this instead of the palla for a year of mourning. Toga. Women divorced on grounds of adultery were not permitted to wear the stola and vitae. Instead, she had to wear the toga. Republican period women had softly waved hair. By the end of 1 AD, complex, almost architectural form were built up of curls, braids and artificial hair. Blonde hair was fashionable and achieved through bleaching or wearing wigs. In the later empire, the hairstyles became simplified with braids or locks doubled up in back and pinned to the top of the head. Men's hair was cut short and arranged by a barber. Sometimes straight hair was favoured, sometimes curly. Men who wished to appear more youthful dyed their hair. Beards predominated in the Republican years, clean-shaven faces during the empire. 
the Romans used a variety of accessories in their daily life, such as handbags and fans that were carried by women. Sole, sandalus, this was sandals. Socus, a slipper-like shoe reaching the ankle. Sudarium, these were handkerchiefs or wiping off perspiration, veiling the face or holding in front of the mouth to prevent disease. Orarium. This was a slightly larger version of the sudarium. It became a symbol of rank and was worn by upper-class women neatly pleated across the left shoulder or forearm. Mapa. This was a table napkin. This module focuses on the Gupta period costume and culture. The Gupta period was founded at the beginning of the 4th century AD. It lasted more than two centuries and stretched over a major part of North India and to Balkh in the East. The period was also known as the Golden Age or the Classical Period and achieved a remarkable degree of balance and harmony in all the arts along with an efficient administrative system. Sanskrit became the official language and Kalidas wrote Shakuntala as well as Malvika Agnimitra. During the Gupta period, vegetarianism was practiced and Hinduism was widespread. Neither Harsha nor the Guptas were able to conquer the South. Previously, there was a lot of influence from the Western world, but under the Gupta Empire, India was more isolated. Previous evidence of costume was derived mainly through sculpture, but in this period, the wall paintings of Ajanta provide evidence of costume that most vividly mirror contemporary life and dress. Preference was given in the north to stitched garments. The Gupta kings realized the value of adopting a form of dress that had become traditionally identified with royalty. Formal attire included the coat, trouser with boots, although they continued to wear indigenous Antarya, Uttarya and Kayabant for informal occasions. Kanchuka inspired the brocade tunic worn by higher officials at court. A white calf-length tunic was worn by the chamberlain with a chadar adding dignity to his attire. The Ushnisa was slowly becoming obsolete. It was now associated with certain dignitaries, ministers and court officials. The Sakas in this period wore light white, tunic-like coat and skull cap worn with striped or gathered stockings or narrow trousers, which was common for the Gupta period. The king's costume was striped blue, closely woven silk with a floating uttarya. Both fabrics would have woven borders. Instead of kayabant, a plain cord or belt became more popular. Kings also wore a very elaborate mukut or crown to set them apart. The Gupta period adopted a number of different styles to wear a variety of costumes. During this period, Indian women frequently began to clothe the top half of their bodies. Antarya was worn in several different ways. Lehenga style was wrapped around the hip very tightly to accentuate the curve most seductively and was normally calf length. Kalanki was similar to lehenga style except it was worn in kacha style and then wrapped around the hips. Kacha style became less popular and more feminine styles like lehenga and lungi became popular. Berni Vasani was a precursor to the drawstring skirt. Ghagri was a heavily gathered skirt tied with a nara or string was used by dancers so that the swirling effect is enhanced while twirling. Ardhoruka were Langoti style drawers. The Angraka style kurta with crossover flap and side opening was used. Uttarya remained but was worn more as a flattering accessory. Indigenous garment addition Cholaka, Chola, Choli, Cholika, Kancholika. Primitive Choli was cut from a square piece of cloth with a slit for the neck. A further development of the choli is the fold back at the bottom edge and the introduction of strings attached to make it backless. The apron-like attachment at the front of the choli would have evolved from the need of protection against cold or modesty. Simple plates were no longer in fashion. Hairstyles became so elaborate that maids who were expert hairdressers were sought after. Foreign influence brought short hair frizzy at the front 
with ringlets framing the face or just hanging loose. The bun worn high or low on the neck or knotted at the side or top of the head. It was kept simply wound, coiled sometimes in the shape of a figure eight, largely and loosely wound but always surrounded by flowers or a large lotus tucked into it. The women used different headgear for their hair. Ratna jali, a jeweled hairnet, mukta jali, a hairnet covered with pearls, tiaras were often used, pearl strings were used to define hair parting, turbans were occasionally worn by women. Flowers were abundantly used as part of headgear. The turban was replaced with a tiara or crown, with a band inset with pearls, sometimes festooned with garlands. Men wore their hair shoulder length, curled and loose in Gurna Kuntala style, sometimes with a headband to hold it in place. Short hair was also very common, except a clear parting is seldom visible. The king on formal occasions wore skull cap or helmet as headgear. The royal entourage wore turbans and it denoted a distinctive symbol of their rank. Royalty prided itself in the art of Ratna Pariksha or appreciation of gems and were the main customer of precious gems. Men sometimes wore button type ear earrings in one ear and a ring type in the other. Elongated ears were fashionable and were achieved by inserting plugs of graded sizes into the lobes of the ear. Other jewellery items used during the Gupta period are listed here. Kundala, a general term for earrings. These were two types, large ring type and button type called Karnaful. Bali, a small gold wire circlet with pearls and jewels strung. Kankala Kundala, a tremulous earring. Sutra, a chain for the neck. Hema Sutra, when a chain of gold had precious stones in the center. Haravasti, a single strand of pearls. Tarahari, one of the big pearls. Sudha Ekavali, one with a gem in the center of the pearl. Vijayantika, a necklace made from a successive series of pearls rubies, emeralds, blue stones and diamonds that was more soft, sought after. Niska, a gold chain that was popularly used. Angara, an upper arm ornament shaped like a coiled snake. Keyura, an upper arm ornament like a cylinder made of filigree work or inset with pearls. Valaya, bracelet of pearls. Bangles of conch shells were worn in graded sizes. Angulia were rings. Ratan Angulia were rings with studded ornaments. Kirita and Mukut were tiaras and crowns worn by men and women, often with pearls suspended from them to delicately surround the face of the wearer. Girdles and anklets, jeweled girdles and anklets were still in use. Vaishaka style, of wearing pearls was also evident. Kinkini, anklets with tiny belts. Maninpura, anklets with jeweled beads. Flowers were worn in the form of necklaces or mala were worn on the head. Garlands were usually made of kadama flowers. Sometimes garlands of clove mingled with nutmeg, camphor and other spices were used on ceremonial occasions. In the early Gupta period, soldiers wore antarya with the chest bare and inadequately covered by the six jewel strapped channavira. This evolved into the more efficient kanchuka with trousers or short drawers known as jhangia and high boots with a helmet or cap. The indigenous army had no fixed costume. The king adopted the Kushan royal costume for formal occasions as status symbol. Gupta soldiers wore antarya with a bare chest inadequately covered by six jewel-strapped channavira. This evolved into a more efficient kanchuka with trousers, jhangia and high boots with helmet or cap. The army was divided into foot soldiers, cavalry and elephant riders with heads for each of these sections. The king had his own entourage with his sword-bearer and bodyguard.
The tunics worn by soldiers were sometimes spotted with black aloe wood paste, which could be a type of tie-dye or bandhani known today. It may have been their version of camouflage. Instead of kanchuka, a short, tight-fitting blouse or cholaka was worn with short antarya. Hindu sannyasis wore red ochre robes very similar to those of Buddhist monks. The Brahmin Acharya normally wore a short antarya and uttarya. They covered their head with a kantop, a cap, or with a top knot on their head. They even wore sandals. The Buddhist monks or nun wore linen or silk. The poorer ones dyed their rags yellow or red. The empire was a highly civilized empire. Sculptures and paintings show bodies with an easy flowing movement, jeweled headdresses and striped muslin lehengas adding to the sensuous fullness of the body. The mood is relaxed, somnolent and languorous, a kind dreamlike delicacy with sheer floating scarves and shining eyes. Pearl strands decorate the archways and are looped on diadems and around necks. You have come to the end of this unit. To summarize, in this unit, you have understood the origin and evolution of costumes as it evolved through the ages in Western and Indian subcontinent. You were also able to appreciate costume diversity and its nuances through the contextual study of art, design and material cultures and understood that the evolution of costume was a manifestation of socio-cultural, political, economic influences of that period. Thank you.